Have you ever wondered why A-level mathematics seems way harder than secondary school mathematics? The core ideas are algebra, calculus, geometry, and probability, just like in secondary school mathematics. The closest link between A-level mathematics and secondary school mathematics is algebra, and the closest idea in algebra to what we're familiar with is solving equations. In secondary school, we are very familiar with solving two equations in two unknowns. A natural question to ask is, can we solve three equations in three unknowns? Be it tedious algebra or technology, we can solve curve-fitting problems or shopping problems as well. Furthermore, solving a system of two equations is equivalent to finding the intersection of two lines in two-dimensional space. The same could be said for three equations, where now we intersect between three planes, which we will analyze a bit more in the topic of vectors. If we can solve equations, can we solve inequalities? At the high school level, we may have been acquainted to solve quadratic inequalities. And at the advanced level, we'll solve inequalities involving higher powers and possibly even fractions. Using our ideas in equations and inequalities, we can talk about sequences of numbers. Two really important sequences are the arithmetic progression, where you start at the first term A, and you add D each time to get the next term, as well as the geometric progression, where you start from the first term A, and instead of adding by a common difference D, you multiply by a common ratio R. A natural follow-up question is to find the sum of the first n terms of the sequence. We call this idea a series, and the arithmetic series is given by the number of terms over 2 times the first plus the last, while the geometric series is given by the first term times 1 minus R to the number of terms, all over 1 minus r. A natural question of curiosity is taking an infinite sum. If this number exists, we call it the sum to infinity. For an arithmetic progression, there is no sum to infinity. But for a geometric progression, the sum to infinity exists when the r to the n term approaches 0. And the ideas we develop regarding arithmetic and geometric progressions can be used to solve problems pertaining fitness and finance. Sequences are a special type of functions, which essentially take in an input and give out an output. Two crucial types of functions are composite functions and inverse functions. The composite function exists when the range of the inner function lies inside the domain of the outer function. Likewise, a function has an inverse precisely when it is one-to-one, -one, and is usually ascertained through the horizontal line test. Inverses are really useful to make sense of transformations because equations and graphs do the exact opposite of one another. And graphs are essentially generalizations of functions, which includes the conic sections such as the ellipse and the hyperbola. Functions in particular are the main object of study in calculus, and two operations we are really interested in performing are differentiation and integration. We like to know what we can do with differentiation and what kinds of problems we can solve using differentiation. In secondary school, we have learned many common derivatives of several common functions, as well as the three golden rules in differentiation. The chain rule when it comes to differentiating composite functions, the product rule when it comes to products of functions, and the quotient rule when it comes to quotients of functions, which in some sense can be regarded as a special case of the product rule. The chain rule is really useful in helping us compute derivatives where we can't really isolate the y from the x. For example, we want to find the derivative of y with respect to x, but y is related to x via the equation sine x plus y equals to x plus y squared. The chain rule helps us differentiate on both sides, where we differentiate layer by layer. Differentiating the outside, we get cosine, and differentiating the inside, we get 1 plus the derivative of y with respect to x. Likewise, we can compute on the right-hand side and simplify using some algebra to obtain the derivative of y with respect to x, even though there was no real way that we could have isolated y. This technique, known as implicit differentiation, allows us to derive the derivatives of several inverse trigonometric functions, which are formulas that are new in the A-levels. The chain rule also helps us talk about related rates of change, 
where the derivative of y with respect to t can be broken down into its constituent derivatives. And we can use these ideas to solve optimization problems such as maximizing the profit of a company, a key result in microeconomic analysis. We can even use these ideas to approximate really complicated functions using relatively simple polynomials. This is known as the Maclaurin series of the function, and all it requires are the derivatives of the function at zero. The opposite of differentiation is integration, and similarly, we want to know what we can do with integration and what we can solve using integration. Since one of the key results in differentiation is the chain rule, one of the key things we want to do is reverse the chain rule. This is the source of many, many formulae that many students unfortunately memorize, when in principle, the reverse chain rule is the only formula that we actually need. We would also be interested in trying to reverse the product rule. So starting with the product rule, we can integrate on both sides and do a bit of algebra. The result is a formula more commonly known as integration by parts. I like to call this the ISID approach because the V prime gets integrated while the U gets differentiated. And integration is a very useful tool in helping us make sense of spatial measures such as areas under curves, as well as volumes of revolution. Areas under curves are given by the integral of y dx because essentially we are adding up many many rectangles with height y and width dx. Likewise for volume of revolutions, where we sum up cylindrical disks with base area pi y squared and height dx. And this idea of area can be formalized using Riemann sums. One of the biggest uses of integration is to solve differential equations. Some equations can be solved using the method of separable variables, where we bring the y's to one side and the x's to the other side, and then integrate. And since differential equations pertain rates of change, it is really useful to model the phenomena of velocity and acceleration in kinematics, as well as fluid flow in dynamics. The basic equation pertaining exponential growth is also very useful to make sense of population, and the notion of population is used in many biological systems as well as chemical reactions. So far in A-level mathematics, that's algebra and calculus. But what about geometry? Zooming in on geometry, our key objects of study are vectors in three-dimensional space. We're interested in making sense of lines not just in two dimensions with equation y equals to mx plus c, but lines in three dimensions as well. The two-dimensional equation gives us some insight. We start at the point c and we travel x units in the direction m. Likewise, in three dimensions, we start from a position a and travel lambda units in the direction d. Doing a bit of algebra, we can obtain the Cartesian equation of a line in three-dimensional space. The two-dimensional analog of a line is a plane. Just like a line, we start from the point A, we travel S units in the direction U, and T units in the direction V. But this can get unwieldy really quickly, since U and V are not very easily determined by a plane. To pin down the idea of where a plane is located, will employ the cross product between two vectors, which is a vector whose components are essentially cross terms, which can be shown to be perpendicular to both A and B. Another really useful way to multiply vectors is the dot product, where we sum the terms whose components correspond with one another. This can be shown to be equal to the modulus of A times the modulus of B times the cosine of the angle between the vectors, and using both products allows us to describe the plane in a much cleaner manner. We'll calculate the vector that's perpendicular to both u and v, and it can be shown that the plane will have the following scalar product equation, r dot n equals to a dot n. Roughly speaking, this tells us the direction that the plane is perpendicular to. We can even plug in the variable vector r with x, y, and z, and the constant normal vector n with a, b, and c. Doing a bit of algebra on the dot product, we obtain the Cartesian equation of a plane. And in general, three planes give us a unique intersection, which can be used to solve equations. Dot product is a really useful idea because it connects the algebraic calculation in terms of a sum product, with the geometric interpretation in terms of the angle between the two vectors. By isolating cosine of theta, 
we can obtain projections and perpendicular distances between various geometric objects. Intersecting geometry and algebra is the study of complex numbers. The complex numbers are the collection of numbers of the form a plus bi, where i is given by the square root of minus 1. This might be counterintuitive, but by treating i as a second dimension of numbers, we can treat a plus bi as points on a plane. This is known as the Cartesian form of a complex number. An addition of complex numbers in Cartesian form resemble that of vector addition. But complex number multiplication may be a little bit more challenging to compute. Using some calculus, we can obtain the exponential form of the complex number from its Cartesian form and exploit the exponential property to obtain a very succinct multiplication of complex numbers property. Three large areas of A-level mathematics are therefore algebra, calculus, and geometry. And these areas of math are relatively certain. We would also like to make sense of uncertainty and we'll do that through the study of probability. The fundamental ideas of probability are straightforward. Probabilities must be non-negative, probabilities of unions should be sums of probabilities, and probabilities of everything ought to be one. A key instance of probability can be found through combinatorics, where we cleverly count the number of ways that many different objects can be arranged. N factorial counts the number of ways that N people can stand in a line, and n choose r counts the number of ways that r people can be chosen out of n people. By making sense of conditional probabilities and independence, we can even talk about the notion of random variables. There are two types of random variables, discrete random variables and continuous random variables. The ideas in combinatorics and probability helps us make sense of discrete random variables, and two really important equations in this area are the expectation and variance properties. The variance properties hold when x and y are independent. And it's rather surprising that these equations hold even when x and y are not just discrete, but continuous as well. What's even more fascinating is that these ideas at a deeper level are applications of integration. But perhaps that's a video for another time. A really useful example of a discrete random variable is the binomial distribution, where we count the number of successes out of n trials with probability of success p. We can use our probability techniques to make sense of the formulas involving the probability, expectation, and variance of a binomial distribution. And analogously, a really important example of a continuous random variable is a normal distribution, where the first term represents the mean and the second term represents the variance. If y is another normal distribution that's independent of x, then the sum of x and y must be a normal distribution as well, where the expectation and the variance are calculated using the formulas derived previously. A special case of this property is by considering n observations from the same distribution and computing the sample mean or rather sampling distribution of these observations. The result is a normal distribution with mean mu and variance sigma squared over n. But what happens if these observations do not follow a normal distribution, but whose mean is mu and variance is sigma? Rather surprisingly, if n is sufficiently large, then we still get a normal distribution approximately. This is known as the central limit theorem, and it is the link between any distribution, including the binomial distribution, to the normal distribution. These ideas can be used to test hypotheses that help us make sense of general data given some specific data, whose solution is really useful in business analytics and in the social sciences. Our ideas so far revolve around the random variables being independent, but if they are not independent, then they are correlated with one another. This helps us make sense of how different ideas and products are related, once again useful in these social sciences. And rather surprisingly, the ideas needed to calculate the line of best fit are directly linked to the study of vectors. So what makes A-level mathematics a lot more challenging is the large amounts of content and the deep interconnections between the various ideas. This is A-level mathematics in a nutshell.